Bioecology and biodiversity. Um, it's very important that you understand the role of fire. Uh, I'm sure you've heard um, negatives about fire in our medium, our media, and I'm sure you've heard positive uh, in different classes. Uh, it's something that I worked on for 15 years, the effects of fire on animals uh, right here in Arizona. Uh, it's complex. You can't just paint it as white or gray. And um, in the area where we're going, where there's still a lot of rural indigenous people, uh, it's quite a tool. So it's important for you to understand what's going on, uh, not only in Africa, but around the world. This is what we see um, in headlines in Ghana, 29% of the forest uh, has been is gone because of repeated forest fires since 1983. Uh, further 55% has been partially degraded, um, worth $100 million is lost to fires. And people read that uh, and think fire is negative, fire is bad. They get a gut reaction to it, fire is bad. Uh, the next one, uh, 97 through 98, Southeast Asia burned more than 9.7 million hectares, resulting in a ten billion dollar economic losses affected the health of more than 100 million people uh, again fire is bad um, you know the average public doesn't have the education you do nor do they have the time to get the education uh, that you have uh, they don't have the interest um, maybe a passing interest but not as intense as what yours is uh, and why should you care what the public thinks? Because they're going to determine what laws are passed. You are not going to work in a bubble as a biologist and a conservationist. Uh, so you have to be involved in public education. Here's one that gives two messages. Large fires in the U.S. result in property loss more than $9 billion. Suppression costs $3 billion. But then they back it up with a little information here. Scientists estimate that 51 million hectares of U.S. Uh, contain fire dependent ecosystems, which I'll explain to you here in a second, are undergoing major shifts in composition, structure, and function because ne of nearly a fire suppression. They're talking about us here in Arizona, by the way, uh, especially in the interior west, unless actively restored through prescribed fire and increased national fires, augmented by judicious forest thinning. Many natural communities and species identified as targets for biodiversity will be imperiled. And the U.S. Federal Energy Agencies just aren't doing the work. Um, it's a good paragraph. Uh, I think you probably understand it. Uh, this isn't a public education class, but I think most of the public, that would be over their heads. So, um, and, and hopefully it wasn't over years, but I'm going to make sure it wasn't. So, let's look at fire ecology and biodiversity. Um, fire history is determined through satellite records. That's the more recent one. Uh, dendrochronology, which is looking at tree rings, and when a fire burns, if the tree is not totally destroyed it will, or still alive, it will leave a black mark on your, every tree ring. Uh, you can determine fire history from soils, particularly in lakes. Uh, you can go down and do a soil core in the bottom of the lake, pull it up, and you can look at each year will leave different layers. And obviously layers where there's a lot of ash are, are easier for them to discover and they can uh, determine fire history. Uh, modeling it is, is very important to understanding our biotic communities um, and the animals that live there. Uh, basically when fire was switched off through fire suppression, uh, tree cover increased from 27 to 56 percent of the vegetated earth's surface, uh, more than half the global distribution of tropical savannas are have, have transported into uh, forest. So a lot of our tropical areas that are tropical forests naturally were not tropical forests; they were tropical savannas. Uh, maybe you think that's good, but the animals that evolved there uh, they can't they can't make that kind of switch. Um, fire has very predictable features on how it spreads. There's tremendous number of fire models. Fire science is more uh, fighting, fighting fires and predicting where they're going, um, but it's not a bad idea for biologists to understand that. Um, 
and that predictability has led to the idea of fire regimes um, which means depending on the vegetation the spatial area uh, and consequences it, 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 you can predict the impact on vegetation on the soils um, and fire managers have developed these empirical relationships uh, with climate, wind speed, moisture deficit, etc., to calculate fire danger. And if you want to go to that website on that hyperlink, uh, you can see it's pretty sophisticated. Although fire is somewhat predictable, it doesn't burn uh, randomly. Uh, this is a fire from Tanzania, um, and it was influenced by topography. Uh, this was a riparian ecosystem. I suspect this was a grassland fire. So where you had mesic areas and trees, the fire couldn't grow there, the fire couldn't burn there, uh, so it burned the grass and the smaller shrubs and the smaller trees and left the more green. This was probably a very healthy fire um, for a grassland. Fire typically increases uh, in arid environments after a wet period. Um, that's kind of what's going on here in Arizona. We've had a lot of summer uh, rains in April and May, uh, which really increased uh, annual growth. Um, you might call them weeds, we call them annuals. Um, so that's fuel. As soon as that stuff dries out, that's fuel. So uh, fire managers are, are very concerned about places in Arizona this year because of a wet period. Conversely, uh, in an area that's usually wet, um, like Yellowstone, uh, you're not going to get fires very often until you have a, an extreme drought. Fire is important for nutrient recycling, um, especially in, in South American grasslands and savannas and South African. Uh, it's very important in Mediterranean shrublands, which uh, we know as chaparral. Uh, it's more important in these shrub woodlands because it these br these this brush the nutrients actually get locked up in it uh, because it's so dry and arid it's very slow for decompose there's not a lot of bacteria uh, and the plant growth really reduces the amount of nutrition available to animal reduces the animal populations reduce fire is a natural part of that system and uh, the health it's a healthy part um, Nature Conservancy, which is a private organization, which I'm a, a, a good member of, I, I really like most of what they do, um, have a fire dependent, uh, they, they've done the most work on, on looking at fire ecology. And they and some prominent biologists, excuse me, have produced um, three general, maybe four uh, classifications. The first is fire dependent and influence fire regimes. These are areas where burning is necessary uh, for a healthy biotic community. Grasslands, Mediterranean shrublands, chaparral. 36%, um, these are, are the, the, what they consider the most important biotic communities. 36% uh, are fire sensitive, uh, meaning that fire could have very negative effects there. Uh, tropical forest. Uh, that should be tropical forest, it's been a tropical forest, if it burns, it's not positive. Uh, and then 18% are fire independent, and we'll go over what that means. It means it very rarely uh, burns there. Uh, and this is the number of habitats where the fire regime has been changed, uh, and it's no longer natural. And you can see here in the southwest, uh, we're very degraded and declined. Uh, our forests uh, in the southwest are completely different than they used to be. Uh, and, but this isn't a, an Arizona lecture, this is a world lecture. Uh, you can see that some of the savanna areas, some of the areas around the Cape here, this is where we're going to be. And, and the, the, the primary reason that the fire um, suppression is in this area is this is where all the people live. So. Uh, that often is the case. Um, among globally important ecoregions, uh, back from the biodiversity lecture, I talked briefly about um, 
hot spots or areas that are of great concern for conservationists. Um, the, uh, if, if you were to take a class in the fall, there's a lot of reading that you need to do for an assignment. Uh, but 84% of those areas that are produced, uh, uh, that are predicted as the highest areas of need of protection are assessed at a risk from altered fire regime. Now that could be that the fires aren't burning there anymore, or it could be that the fires are burning too much. This is uh, fire sensitive ecosystems. Uh, and again, these are systems that are, are negatively impacted. 90% of, of some of those important ecoregions, and that's because they're burning the tropical forest to clear it. Um, and fire dependent, meaning they need, this area needs fire. Uh, it's 56% of it is degraded, and that's because of the lack of fire. So again, it really, you know, there's no black and white. There's no fire bad. There's Fire's bad here, but fire's good here. Uh, it's very difficult to, to uh, paint a, a nice brush stroke uh, and get a nice simple answer. So let's look at the different classifications of ecosystems. The first being fire independent. I've got a picture over here of the Mojave Desert up in northwest Arizona. There's just not enough vegetation to carry a fire here. I mean when you start having three to four feet um, to, uh, I don't know what that came from, three to four feet uh, in between the different plants, uh, the fire is not going to carry. So if lightning were to strike this creosote bush, it would burn up that creosote bush, maybe a few grass patches, and then that would be it. Uh, other areas like the Arctic tundra, it's too cold. Uh, some areas are too wet. Um, you're not going to get a fire. I, I don't care how many fire sticks you have, matches you have. You're not going to get a fire going in southeast Alaska unless there's been like a three, a, a, a twenty-year drought. Uh, it's just too wet. Um, now, people will try and try and change that, but 18% um, of the area that are considered the most important are dominated by fire-independent deserts, Arctic tundra, and really wet tropical areas, um, rainforests. And for some reason, the slide is not changing. Fire-sensitive ecosystems. Uh, these are areas that have not evolved with fire as a significant or recur recurring process. Here's a tropical forest. Uh, the species don't really have adaptations to respond to fire and mortality. Uh, under natural undisturbed conditions, fire is very rare. Um, so human ignitions are the are primary causes of fires in these areas. As fires become frequent, ecosystem shifts to a more fire-prone vegetation. Tropical forests become savannas of introduced grasses, semi-arid grasslands, uh, and then they continue to burn. So you lose that area entirely. And then fire-sensitive ecosystem, uh, again, excuse me, uh, they're now being exposed to frequent ignitions, primarily by humans. Um, the problem is, if you get these ignitions, uh, in these areas of the world, there's not the money to fight fires. Fighting fires is very difficult anyway. Uh, they very rarely put a fire out. They're praying for wind changes. Uh, but experience, uh, the people there don't have the experience. And number one, they don't have enough money to even fire, hire rangers for their parks, much less have a bunch of bombers that can dump slurry on fires uh, so they're really not going to be able to put it out uh, and so once they get started it, it's going to change um, some ecosystems that have changed uh, severe in Indonesia Ghana and Brazil uh, 150 to 250 million hectares of the 1.8 billion hectares of tropical forest are affected by wildfire annually these are not caused by lightning these are caused by people um, temperate broadleaf forest, uh, for example, in the eastern United States. That's not an area that burns frequently unless it's ignited by humans or you're in a severe drought. Then we get into fire-dependent ecosystems. Those are going to be the opposite of fire-sensitive. These are areas that evolved under a high fire uh, regime 
I'll explain to you what that is, and that really changes as well. Um, without fire, these ecosystems will change uh, dramatically, uh, and it's an essential process to maintain. There's uh, a couple cheetah brothers checking out an area. If, they, if that area doesn't burn, uh, then the brush takes over uh, and the cheetah is displaced. They cannot hunt in that. So you, you lose the animals as well as the vegetation. Uh, many species, and we're talking about plants here, uh, depend on fire to complete their life cycles. A lot of pine nuts, uh, some other species, they will not uh, germinate uh, until they've been burned. That's known as serotonin. Um, and acacias, legumes, uh, they're germinated by heat. Um, some examples of fire dependent ecosystems are all over Arizona. This is the Chiricahuas, which is fire dependent. Savannas, which are grasslands. Uh, South American grasslands, Cerrado, Llano, Papas. Southeastern Asia, pine forest. There is coniferous forest in Southeast Asia. Mexico and Central America's pine oak forest, which is what this is, just reached into Arizona. African shrublands, North American grasslands, uh, and then those Mediterranean communities. You know, the, the South African finbos, we're going to see lots of that. That's thicket, uh, chaparral type uh, area, very brushy. Eucalyptus is a species of tree that evolved with fire, so there's a lot of fire in Australian forest, um, but it's not good for all Australian forest, and we'll get to that. Uh, they respond really well. These are eucalyptus trees that have been burned and they have these epicormic buds inside the underneath the bark uh, and they immediately re-sprout. Then there's the fourth classification which are fire influenced ecosystems. I've got a picture here from the inside of a riparian ecosystem along a creek there. Um, and they're kind of a, a in-between fire dependent and fire sensitive. Um, they're usually sensitive to fire, but contain some species that respond positively. Uh, and some of these ecosystems are anthropogenically created by his historic man's presence. Uh, and we'll get to some examples of that, uh, particularly in places like uh, Australia and Africa. So here you, you've got a picture from Australia and Savannah. All these areas are right here, and these would be the fire... Uh, fire-influenced ecosystems. Um, the area here would be the fire-dependent ecosystems. So riparian areas in between uh, tropical forest, uh, the, the transition zones in between tropical forest, uh, the pine species there, the Pantanal and Br Brazil, which is a, a primary wetland, uh, riparian vegetation and grasslands or savannas. Um, fire influenced ecosystems in Australia are fire have been influenced since the Aborigines first settled about 40,000 years ago. Now this is exactly what we're talking about. This is they probably came there with a fire sensitive ecosystem. Um, and they brought fire with them and there's a lot of good reasons why early indigenous people would use fire because it creates grasslands, it creates what we call green ups, which is new vegetation. Animals respond to that, herbivores respond to that, and it makes it easier to hunt them. Uh, so people have been using fire for over 40,000 years in Africa uh, to help them hunt. And, and they transformed the Central Australian from a drought adapted uh, mosaic of tree shrubs uh, to a modern fire adapted desert scrub. Uh, climate modeling suggests that the climate actually changed due to the vegetation change. The vegetation change was due to Aborigines using fire. Uh, and this change in May uh, have caused the extinction of Australian megafauna. Uh, which were any animals greater than a thousand kilograms. They had some huge wombats, uh, that kind of thing, and, and they're gone now. And it's widely accepted that at the time of the European colonization, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, Aboriginal fire management was very skillful, and it maintained the vegetation patterns that they had created starting 40,000 years ago. Uh, however, when Europeans came, 
they thought all fire was bad, uh, and they tried to suppress it. Uh, they outlawed the aboriginals uh, from where they could from burning. Uh, and studies in northern Australia shows that areas with aboriginal fire management increase kangaroo density, small mammals, and granivorous birds. So these animals respond, responded very positively to their the aboriginal burn um, processes, whereas some did not. So those mega herbivores were not able to, but many of the kangaroos and small mammals were. A couple pine species, King Billy and the cypress pines, are fire sensitive. Uh, but they survive very well during the Aboriginal frequent cool season fires because when these guys burn, they don't burn when it's going to be the height and the worst case fire. They burn when it's going to be a cool fire. They can walk around around it. It's not dangerous to them. It won't burn up their their housing, their huts, whatever they've got at that time. Um, and when you stop that type of fire uh, and start allowing the fuel to build up, meaning dead trees, dead grass, uh, and then you get a, a catastrophic fire, uh, crown burning, something like this, uh, the trees die uh, before they did not. Uh, so these are fire sensitive trees in catastrophic fires, but not cool fires. Uh, and when they started suppressing it, uh, those that pine species declined by 30 uh, percent. Under the aboriginal burning, small fires result in different patches of successional stages. One park studied in 1953 found 374 fire scars, the mean fire area of 34 hectares. So these are small, cool fires. Uh, when the Europeans settled, created the null fire law, no burning law, after 30 years, there was one fire scar of allowed about 100 times the size. So much more catastrophic fire, killing vegetation. It resulted in declines in wallabies, small mammals, granivorous birds, uh, all section when fire suppression started after European settlement. Now, if you're listening to me talk, um, and it, it gets much more in depth than this, there's quite a few websites on, on Australian fire regimes um, that it, it there's tropical forest that you don't want to burn in Australia uh, that you don't want too many fires in those pine areas uh, so it's kind of like an art it, it's very difficult to say it's a science sometimes um, so the Australian parks originally were no fire at all uh, and now they're trying to come up with some kind of management system, and, and I, I, I fully empathize with them. I understand a lot about fire, and I understand it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to predict. It's very difficult to, um, to apply. So this is a, a quote that I took from their website, from the Australian Parks. The question is, how should we respond to the changing fire regime? So they've gone to, from uh, an aboriginal burn to uh, no burning. Efforts to maintain historic fire regimes through hazard reduction, burning, and vigorous fire suppression may be resource intensive, eliminate success, and have a greater impact on biodiversity than natural changes in regime, merely, therefore more effective to allow change and manage the consequences. The challenge is to find a way to do this while ensuring some pseudo habitat is available for sensitive species, in other words, those that have to have fire, while simultaneously meaning the threat to urban areas, infrastructure, and public safety. This is something that if you get into conservation, you have to be aware of, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it now, but if you want to implement fire, and I'm one of these people who really wants to implement fire more, uh, you can't just go striking matches around cities. I mean, you have to do an incredible amount of planning. Um, there's no one size fit all. There, there, to me, in our business, in biology, there is no silver bullet. There's silver buckshot, meaning lots of different ways to try things. There's no silver bullet. I haven't seen one in the 37 years of my career. I haven't seen one researcher come up quote, this is the way we fix that. It, it is not one, one way, uh, one size fits all. Savannas, and this is why we get up early in the morning in Kruger. This is in Kruger. Uh, zebras become 
intensely beautiful when they're in their natural surroundings instead of a, a dirt pad zoo. Um, but savannas are the most fire prone ecosystems on earth, uh, characterized by tree and grass. You can see there's a few trees there. Uh, how trees and grasses coexist has long puzzled ecologists. Uh, savannas are very flammable. You can see this is the dry season when we'll be there. Even though it's their winter, it's their dry season, opposite of us. Um, and fire has been described as a herbivore in savannas. Uh, and the frequency controls the recruitment of the savanna tree, particularly the growth of saplings into the tree area. Uh, unlike mature trees, mature trees can generally handle uh, a savanna fire because it doesn't get that hot. Uh, but young trees cannot. Um, so how trees get started is still puzzling to, to many of us who want to understand. Uh, fire sometimes competes, replaces, or facilitates herbivory, meaning it, it makes things better for the herbivores, often makes things better. Uh, if we look at Kruger National Park, here's a buffalo in Kruger. Uh, don't get out of the car there. Many studies have shown that fire exclusion led to an increase in woody biomass, like you can see around him, even forestation implicating that fire is essential for some animation. Um, but Kruger's pretty dry and you're never going to have a huge forest. Um, so it, 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 certainly fire is very important, not as important as in some other areas where it's mythic, wet, and fire, a forest could take over a grassland and that's not what the animals evolved with. Looking at variability of fire levels in Kruger for soil fertility, the amount of rainfall, the lever of levels of herbivory, um, soils influence the, brand, the plant growth because of the fuel load. There's two basic types of soils in Kruger, uh, the granite based and the basalt. Uh, basalt is going to have more vegetation growth because it's due to rich, therefore it's going to have more fuel, probably more frequent fires. Rainfall, I, I don't think I need to explain that. Kruger rainfall can vary fourfold in a year. Uh, and it's quite a bit drier in the south end of the park and the north end of the park. We're going to be primarily in the north end of the park for the last three days. You're going to see a lot more brush. Um, and it can result in a fuel load of five-fold difference um, in, in how that carries. Herbivory can reduce fuel load and even prevent fires. Um, Daytime fires are going to burn differently than nighttime fires. Nighttime fires are cooler. Uh, wet season versus the dry season um, are going to be different. Man cause versus lightning is going to be different. Um, Cape buffalo populations influence fire frequency. Elephants have the most influence uh, because they are the ecosystem engineers. Um, the variability depends primarily on fuel load and the climatic conditions at which the fire, fire burns in the previous six to eight months. High intensities could kill uh, the trees. Uh, less intense allows that portion to survive. Uh, head fires, uh, meaning that the uh, wind is blowing it, have much different effects than a backfire. Fires at night are much less intense. Lightning strikes can have less impact than, for example, a human-caused uh, fire with planned perimeter ignitions. And the Hulului Ampololizi, oh boy, I have a tough time with that one. This is the this is the park name I that had all the rhinos in it that I avoided earlier. Just south of Kruger, uh, excludes excluded fire for a while, and they lost their elephants uh, due to poaching, which resulted in uh, the development of a fire sensitive forest, tropical forest. Uh, that were also fire resistant, and they lost the savanna and the species that were evolved to that ecosystem at that time. You can see they get a lot of rain, 100 millimeters, uh, greater than almost three and a half, four feet. Kruger, uh, we'll see this, where you can see that there's fire in one area, not in the other. Look at the grass color here, look at the grass color there. Where are you going to find herbivores? Remember what I talked about, the indigenous people? Our Native Americans, going back to the bison, they burned all the time to attract bison closer to them. And the bison could smell it, and then they would come. 
fairly ambitious program from 56 to 92. They were really doing a lot of controlled burning. Uh, they did from that time, they noticed some negatives. Uh, increaser grasses, which aren't as, as positive for wildlife, became more dominant in areas with heavy grazing. And that's because when there's a fire, you're going to attract more herbivores. The grazing is going to be coming intense, and it can become too intense if you have frequent fires there, particularly around areas with water. Number of large trees declined. Uh, ring burning, uh, which was human cause, more tense. Uh, and they didn't allow for a lot of variation in intensity. To, they they kind of they scheduled it. All right. Nature doesn't schedule fires. We schedule things. Nature doesn't do that. Nature just allows it to happen. So in 92 to 2001, they stopped all control burning. Uh, lightning fires were allowed to burn freely. All man-caused fires were uh, extinguished. There were no control burns. Thought that that would better simulate natural conditions in which the bio evolved. And it probably would if they had the time to allow it, you know, it would happen for over a couple hundred years. Uh, they finally decided they were losing some sensitive species because of lack of fire in some areas. So they went to a combination of just allowing natural lightning strike fires to some, some controlled burns in areas where it's critical. Uh, for some species. So, got quite a history there, uh, 26 through 47. These were human cause um, to go green grazing for wildlife. Uh, they stopped all prescribed burning because uh, people would come to the park and complain about smoke. And uh, smoke needs to be part of the system here. Formal system of prescribed burning once every three years on fixed management air. That, that scheduling part I was talking about. Uh, they started to consider rainfall fire age specific objectives. Then they went to, oh, we're not going to burn anymore. And finally, now this is what's called adaptive management. Mm. This is the best way to go in my opinion. You learn from your mistakes and you just keep going. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Too many times I hear people in conservation, they're not willing to try something because they think they may make a mistake. Um, there's nothing wrong with making a mistake if you can learn something from it. We're not surgeons. We don't have people that are going to die on the, you know, with endangered species, you got 60 animals left. I can understand that kind of stress. Uh, but for a lot of things we do, I, I don't think it needs to be that stressful. Um, so if in summary, there's been fires over 17 million hectares between 41 and 96. About 16% of the park burned every year. Uh, 5.1 million burned uh, between 41 and 1957 when the control burning and fire protection mandated. Uh, between 57 and 91, they had over 2,000 prescribed burns. Lightning burned another 21.6% of the park with intervals of 1 to 31 years. Mean fire interval is still every four and a half years. So every place we're in Kruger, on average, it burned five years ago or two years ago. But it didn't go up much longer than four to five years. These are the different fire areas uh, and some of the return periods. Um, and it will influence. Uh, they have done some intensive they done some nice research. Uh, plot sizes were too small, but there's some good conclusions as well. Fire has a marked effect on structure, but not necessarily the composition of vegetation. So the, uh, the vegetation shape changes, but not necessarily the species. Frequent fires result in, in, in increased herbivory, herbivory, which can result in an increase in less palatable grass species if there's overgrazing. Uh, the importance of high-intensity winter fires and reducing the structural changes in diversity of trees and shrubs. Frequent burning may help increase elephant density, reduce marula tree densities. This is a, not a positive thing. This is a negative thing that they're concerned about. Because what elephants do is they eat trees. And they oftentimes will strip the bark off this tree. So now that the elephant population is overpopulated, and we'll discuss this in depth uh, before and while in Kruger, uh, when the fires come through, it kills the trees. 
uh, instead of before where it would not have. So it's actually the elephant pop overpopulation that's causing the trees to die, not necessarily the fire. Um, and, and it results in some undesirable changes. Um, basically, elephants have caused up to 18% of the tree mortality. Um, in some areas, so 18% of the trees are dying, uh, less than 5% mortality is needed to maintain the forest. So uh, they can have a negative effect in how they deal with that. This is an area where elephants grazed. This is an area where they're excluded from. Same fire system. So they burned at the same time. You can see that you can have woody shrubs um, when this area is burning. This is prime Impala habitat right here. Uh, prime Kudu habitat right here. Some of the larger browsing antelope species. Um, this is very poor for Impala and Kudu. This is changed by elephant overpopulation, not a fire regime. So they can have a difference. Let's go to Masamari. Uh, you guys have all seen this Serengeti. Uh, and compare that to Kruger. Uh, very similar in grasslands need fire. There's a lot of mega herbivores um, to maintain the grassland. Uh, turn of the century, it was primary glassland as it is today. Uh, the render pest epidemic, which Dr. Miller will teach you about, uh, 1890 left the animal population decline. Fires decreased due to people leaving. The elephant population been greatly reduced as people hunted them for food and ivory. Uh, and when the elephants were gone and no one was burning, uh, the woodlands greatly increased. In the 60s, the people returned along with the elephants and the glasslands. The, the trees disappeared because of fire and elephants. Uh, in 1980, again, uh, poaching became common. Uh, wildebeest and now increased to one and a half million. They removed a lot of the fuel. So when there's a lightning strike, it doesn't carry. Uh, the elephants keep... Um, uh, if the elephants were there, the woodlands will not come back because the elephants are gone because of poaching. Uh, the woodlands are starting to reestablish and they're worried about what may happen to the wildebeest in 20 to 30 years. Kakudu National Park in Australia, uh, dominated by Aboriginal burning, uh, the no burning policy. Um, they began using the Aborigines to burn. Uh, and diversity increased. Uh, now trying and, and they've got to realize that the, the ecosystem that people came to has been evolved with fires for the last 40,000 years. The ecosystem in South Africa has evolved with fires in humans over the last couple hundred thousand years. Uh, you can't just exclude it and not expect a change. Our own Yellowstone National Park, here's part of from fire 1988. Uh, fire history inferred uh, long-lived trees. Uh, they've been able to go back on the fire history to 17,000 BC. There's always been low intensity fires. Uh, most areas burn uh, with a low intensity fire every 20 to 25 years. But the great big fires every two to 400 years. So in 88 when the fire burned 36 percent of the forest in Yellowstone for two months uh, basically until winter moisture. When that, when you got that much of a dry forest, and you're not putting it out. I don't care how many bombers you have. You can try and protect housing. You can't put it out. Um, summer of 88 was the driest in 120, 112 years. But even with this much devastation, but you can see, I don't know, it's a fire I just took last October, picture I took last October. You can see the baby pines, the lodgepoles are coming back. There's some serotonin uh, plant. Their seeds actually germinate much, much better after a fire. Um, and so this was a, a positive fire, even though it burned 36% of the park and tourists were complaining. Um, and, and letting nature take its course oftentimes is the best thing. But you need to know what the regime was in that area, what's natural. Uh, how it's going to affect a lot of different things. There is no, remember, no silver bullets. Um, African examples are similar. Uh, 
but not with Australia and certainly not the boreal forest. So Serengeti and Kruger are very similar. Africa still has the mega herbivores. Um, African colleges believe the lessons learned in Australia should be an important lesson as indigenous people. They're trying to, African ecologists believe that the effect the indigenous people had on the fire regime is something these animals evolved with and that they're trying to protect what was there when the British arrived in the 1700s or the Dutch arrived in 1600. They need to involve fire. Um, this is basically a very informative uh, table which summarizes uh, all the information that I've gone through. Um, Yellowstone is completely different than these. These two are similar. This is different. Uh, and Yellowstone is completely different from all three. And let's just look at indigenous people and why they burn to, to summarize. Farmers used it to clear fields and fertilize. In Ghana, uh, fire was used to prevent the rottenness of the palm tree, um, gives them a better taste, increased the yield of wine during palm wine processing. They didn't kill the trees. Uh, hunters, fire is a tool for smoking out game and creating green. Um, rural communities use fires to cultivate crops, manage pests, disease, hunt, uh, ensure the availability of non-woody projects while the public particularly in our countries, developed countries, we have very negative views of fire. Uh, we need some education here. Um, recent research in the last five decades in Africa, in Namibia, uh, found freshly burnt savanna areas had new plant growth, palatable forage compared to unburnt areas. Um, thick grass, once the grass gets too thick, uh, it's not good for grazing. Uh, it needs to burn, uh, and it can increase the forage nutrition 85%. Wildlife uh, people will burn it to um, for their sheep, their goats, their cattle. Wildlife follow the people. They're following that green grass. It's called riding the protein wave. Uh, when when new vegetation begins to grow, there's a lot of protein. Um, Governments, uh, land management entities, scientists were trying to understand that, um, but they really haven't seen the importance of that indigenous people burning until more, to more recent. The great need for public education, if, if you haven't gotten my message until now. Uh, there's a misconception uh, that the tropics is a vast fire sensitive rainforest. Uh, threatened by rampant logging, induced fire and agriculture burning. In reality, it's there's some very parts of the tropical rainforest where there are broadleaf forest types, where they have a dry season, where periodic fire is part of that system. Um, and it's a fire-influenced ecosystem. It's not a, a fire-sensitive. So education is, is going to be extremely important. That's the last lecture. Uh, that you'll have online before we get to Africa. Then we'll have lots more. Um, I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, I hope this makes sense and contact me if it doesn't. And I got to turn this off. <laughs>